Welcome everyone to the August Professor's Corner Post-Pandemic Landlord Tenant Law and Practice. This program is sponsored by the ABA's Real Property Trust and Estates Law Sections, Legal Education and Uniform Law Group, and it's on the two, second Tuesday of every month. Uh, we host a call that features a panel of professors and practitioners who discuss recent developments and other topics of interest to the practicing bar, as well as academics. If you are not yet a member of the RPTE section, we encourage you to join and take advantage of membership benefits like this webinar. Coming up in September, September 13th, will be our next Professor's Corner webinar entitled Uniform Electronic Estate Planning Documents Execution Act and featuring Gary Beyer, Turney Berry, and moderated by Bradley Myers. Now, uh, today, uh, I am your moderator, Andrea Boyack. I'm a professor and Norman R. Poses, Chair of Business and Transactional Law at Washburn University School of Law. I teach several classes there, including housing law. I am currently the chair of the AALS section on property law and the uh, ABA RPT's legal education group in the committee. And much of my scholarship focuses on our housing law system, and I'm particularly interested in landlord tenant issues. So I'm very happy that I could participate today and moderate this fantastic panel. Our panel of experts includes Professor Serge Martinez, Allison Friedman, and Dorinda Hyatt. Let me just tell you a little bit about them and then. I will stop talking and let them um, take it away. Serge Martinez is a faculty member and associate dean for experiential learning at the University of New Mexico School of Law. He teaches primarily in the School of Law's Economic Justice Clinic, which spoke, focuses on supporting grassroots economic development initiatives, enforcing rights of low-wage workers, and improving housing stability and conditions for low-income tenants. Professor Martinez previously taught at the Morris A. Dean School of Law at Hofstra University and as a visiting professor at National Taiwan University's College of Law. And he was an attorney at the Urban Justice Center's Community Development Project, too, where he represented tenants and tenant associations throughout New York City. Allison Friedman is joining the University of New Mexico School of Law this fall and will be teaching primarily in its economic justice clinic. Formerly, she was at University of Michigan Law School, teaching in the civil criminal litigation clinic there. Her clinical work touches on a variety of areas affecting low-income individuals, and she focuses on housing. Narinda Hyatt is the Associate Professor at Fordham Law School and teaches courses in housing, landlord-tenant law, critical race theory, and property. Her scholarship focuses on the intersection of race, gender, and access to housing and the law. And prior to entering academia, Professor Hyatt spent almost a decade in government law practice at the, U at the U.S. Department of Justice in the Civil Rights Division as a trial attorney advocating on behalf of victims of housing discrimination. Professor Hyatt got a BA from Dartmouth College and a JD from my alma mater, yay, University of Virginia School of Law. And with that, I will turn the time over to our speakers. Take it away, Serge. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm really excited to be here with my amazing co-panelists uh, to talk about post-pandemic landlord-tenant law and practice. And I'm going to share my screen real quick just to, so you can see our names and who we are. And then I'm going to show you a chart in about two minutes. Um, but, uh, you know, I am have been practicing here in New Mexico in the housing arena for about eight years now. Um, and have really been interested in all the things that have been happening in the last couple of years, as I'm sure most people have. Um, so, you know, the pandemic happened. We saw a housing stability crisis here in New Mexico as around the country. But I do want to point out it was already there. Just not that many people were paying attention to it. And the pandemic, uh, I think, you know, one of the silver linings, if that's the right word, um, that I've seen is more attention focused on housing and more people willing to listen to me talk about it than, than ever before. Um, so you all were paying attention, I assume, and saw what happened. We had uh, moratoriums on evictions, uh, federal, I mean, two federal ones on evictions, um, two rounds of federal rental assistance that were totaled about $46 billion, uh, all told, and some really interesting developments around the country that came up to try to address problems of housing stability when you know, during the during the pandemic to focus on public health and also to acknowledge that people's incomes were uh, pretty severely affected uh, in many cases by the pandemic. So in addition to all the money that went out, states, different states and municipalities created eviction diversion programs where they said, look, before you evict somebody, let's make sure that we're applying for all the right money. I'll come back to that. Um, things like a right to counsel have popped up in a few places around the country, even some very unexpected places. And 
there's some place, some jurisdictions that have spent some time thinking about how to expunge the records, eviction records of folks who have been evicted during the pandemic. And we'll touch on some of those this morning and um, talk about a little bit about some case studies as well, right? So the lay of the land today is in terms of all the money that was flowing, some states have run out, some states like mine still have money. Um, rents are increasing rapidly throughout the country and so is housing instability. Evictions, they bottomed out for a while, but they're back on the rise and more people are, joined, are in, finding themselves in court facing eviction again. Um, I think there is some reason for optimism, which we'll talk about, but also lots of room for improvement and lots of lessons to be taken away and ways to move the ball forward, uh, seizing on some of, the, some of the momentum and some of the things and innovation that has happened, which we will also discuss. So our plan this morning is uh, each of us will talk, we'll talk about a couple, a few case studies, you know, based on where we've been practicing and uh, contextualize the national scene um, and talk about areas for advocacy as well as hopefully have some, a little bit of interesting back and forth with me and Professor Friedman and Professor Hyatt. So I'm gonna start because I have the mic. Um, New Mexico, right out of the gate, it was, you know, uh, uh, as soon as we saw the pandemic starting, um, maybe not as quickly as I would have liked, as a, in retrospect, I should have done, but several of, a lot of advocates started joining forces and trying to, you know, what do what folks around the country are doing? Ah, we have to do something. So in New Mexico, it was our state Supreme Court that really took the reins from the get-go. And they implemented almost immediately a moratorium on evictions for non-payment of rent. Well, enforcement of evictions. You could still get the judgment of eviction, but it wouldn't be enforced. Um, and that actually proved to be one of the most durable moratoriums in, uh, that was put into place. It's only recently been phased out. Um, and it was easily circumvented, but I want to give them credit. We saw a huge, a sharp drop off in evictions, which I will now show you. This is so this is a chart from my hometown of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And one of my one of our amazing students who just graduated put together a website called nmevictions.org where he has it tracking evictions basically in real time as far as I can tell and filings. It's a pretty amazing resource and I want to give a shout out to Sam Taub, our recent grad who just took the bar so hopefully is on a beach somewhere. But um, you can see that in March 2020, the evictions took a sharp drop, eviction filings took a sharp drop and they haven't really come back up to what they were. This only goes through May, but I promise you that eviction filings are still below what they have been historically. So we saw, you know, we, we saw that drop off and uh, like many places, what we haven't seen is the, the, you know, the rebound back to the pre-pandemic levels that have been seen and that are happening in lots and lots of places other than us. Um, I think I can explain the why, but I wanna talk about it, right? We, first of all, we got a ton of money from the emergency rental assistance programs, the ERAP money, um, about $350 million in a relatively sparsely populated state with a relatively low number of renters. What that has meant is that we still have a lot of it. Um, and our, you know, okay, on occasion, our uh, the agency in charge of distributing it um, throws up their hands and say, Where, how can we, you know, get this money to more people? We need to get more folks. So. I will recognize we have that luxury here. Um, it's not the case everywhere. Um, we also have our Supreme Court. Uh, when they rolled back the moratorium, they said they weren't just going to do it and say, okay, this is ending next week. That's that. They really thoughtfully approached how to do it in a way that would be, um, you know, as, as non-disruptive as possible. Um, that they, so they, created this program to encourage folks, to, they call it the, the diversion program, to encourage folks to participate in, when you file an eviction for non-payment, as soon as you get to court, the judge says, do you know that there's all this money available for rental assistance? And have you applied for it? And you know, if not, why not? Um, it's voluntary, but there's a lot of enthusiasm uh, in the court to have folks participate in this uh, program. And it has been pretty successful. When, when I've gone, I mean, here in Albuquerque, in the courtroom, 
there is somebody from the city in the virtual courtroom sitting there with a computer who when you know someone says i can't pay the rent they type up they say have you applied for the for erap and they check and they work it out or, and they see if they have it if they have it they can help them and so um like i said it's this it's it's not mandatory, but almost, it's almost universal um, in participation right now. Uh, but again, we have lots of money, right? Still, if, who knows? It's probably healthy to be skeptical about what's going to happen. Whether it'll be everyone will be, so, you know, we're so keen to work together when the money runs out. Um, but to answer one of the questions that we teased in the uh, description, have we seen the tsunami of? evictions that was predicted, right? When our moratorium ended, the answer is no, we haven't, right? I was one of the people who predicted it and I've been grateful to be wrong, right? Um, we sort of envisioned this like, you know, there's a river, we put up the dam and eventually, you know, it's gonna, the dam will burst or when it's opened, all hell will break loose downstream. We haven't actually seen that. Some of that I think is due to the pretty visionary um, approach of our state Supreme Court to try to, to connect as many people as possible with this resource. Um, and also a little bit of, you know, leakage through the years, holes in the dike, or um, I'm not going to carry this metaphor any further, but that, um, you know, people learned you don't have to take someone to eviction court to get rid of them. When New Mexico is the land of the month-to-month -month lease and you just choose not to renew it for any reason or no reason, right? You don't even have to explain why. Um, if you just raise the rent and give someone notice, they will self-evict. So we... I. I think a lot of that pressure, you know, over the last two years dissipated because people found new and creative ways to get rid of tenants that they didn't want to keep um, or to just make them realize that they weren't welcome or they couldn't stay, right? Rents are rising all over the country, even here in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and people just can't afford to keep up with it, uh, which is obviously adding pressure to the housing crisis that we already had. Um, so, um, I will say, though, anecdotally, we talk about this more at all levels, talk about housing stability. Um, among advocates, uh, certainly we've gotten our act together a little bit more um, that we did not have before the pandemic. And elected officials and policymakers are, are talking more about this. I couldn't believe it when a judge in court last week said that, uh, you know, agreed with me that housing was a human right. Um, the, you know, at the same time, Twice now, our efforts to amend landlord-tenant law have failed uh, in New Mexico. We're going to keep trying. So I'm not going to say everything has changed. But also, just a couple months ago, the city of Albuquerque created uh, or made it uh, unlawful to discriminate against someone because of the source of their income in rental housing, basically voucher holders. Um, Right. So, and I don't think that would have happened pre pandemic, pre talking about this. Uh, but again, we have lots of money and we will for a long time. So, what about states in different situations? Uh, I want to turn to my colleagues, Professor Friedman and Professor Hyatt, to talk about their experiences. Uh, Professor Friedman, I believe you are next on our list. Great. Thanks so much, Serge. Um, so, I'm just going to share my screen and put up a couple of slides here. Um, all right. So um, as Serge mentioned, right, the CDC eviction moratorium ends in August 2021, and people were wondering, you know, are we going to have this tsunami of evictions? Serge mentioned that in New Mexico that didn't happen. Um, and luckily, nationally, it seems like as of right now, that hasn't necessarily happened. Narinda is going to touch much more on the national scene, but just to sort of put this in context, eviction filings nationally have remained 26% below historic averages in the 10 months following the end of the moratorium. So that data comes from the Princeton University Eviction Lab, um, which was founded by Matthew Desmond, who I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Um, he wrote the book Evicted, um, which I highly recommend. Um, and he basically said, as you can read on the screen, that this emergency rental assistance program um, has been the most important federal housing policy in the last decade. Um, these efforts, both the moratorium and the rental assistance, um, were the deepest investment in low-income renters the federal government has made since the nation launched its public housing system, and this was a real win. So there's at least some uh, cause for optimism here, as Serge says. I think, you know, there's we'll see kind of how this plays out in Michigan, um, in, New York, in New York and New Jersey. There's also some some cause for skepticism, um, but that's that's sort of at least one individual's perspective. 
Um, so in Michigan, I am currently located um, in New Mexico uh, with Surge, but I spent the last three years um, in Michigan, and so I'm going to focus on Michigan as a case study uh, for the next few minutes. Um, you can see here, there's a lot going on, but just if you focus on the two red circles, um, all the way to the left, um, in 2019, eviction, the eviction rate was hovering around 30% in Michigan. And then if you go all the way over to the right, you can see that now in 2022, it's hovering around 14%. So there's actually, you know, it's been cut in half um, during, during the pandemic. Um, and so that's a pretty big change. I think a lot of that has to do with the emergency rental assistance program, and I'll get into why in a minute. Um, but, you know, potentially some other factors are contributing to that as well. Um, so in Michigan, you know, similar to, to what Serge talked about in New Mexico, there was this eviction diversion program that was sent up, set up. And Michigan and New Mexico actually are quite unique because they are two of the four states who have a statewide eviction moratorium program. Um, so in 180 jurisdictions and 36 states um, across the country, um, there have been eviction diversion programs either developed or enhanced, but Michigan and New Mexico specifically have these statewide programs. So I think that's really helped um, to contribute to the drop in the rate of eviction. Um, and how this program was set up was actually quite a painstaking process. It took a lot of trials and tribulations and a lot of work from people all over the state. Um, so the guidelines were set up by the state legislature and then implemented by um, the Michigan State Housing Authority. And then that trickled down to the local housing authorities to really make it work on the ground. Um, there was a creation of an online portal. And so that's the data you're seeing here. This online portal allowed tenants to apply for rental assistance online. Um, and again, this was not a seamless process in the beginning. Lots of tenants, um, you know, the system would crash. Of course, having an online system is helpful for some, but not accessible for all. So there were also paper applications that were being accepted as well. Um, there were weekly sort of task force meetings among courts and legal aid lawyers and um, landlords lawyers and law school professors. Um, and I think this was really important because it sort of brought everyone to the table so that everyone could sort of understand what was happening on the ground. So, you know, if, for example, the portal wasn't working in a certain way or, you know, courts were having to uh, grant really long adjournments, everyone was sort of on the same page and understanding what was happening um, in that realm. And then similar also to what Serge said is happening in New Mexico, there was a court liaison um, available in all courtrooms. And so that person could sort of check on the Sarah application and say, you know, yes, the tenant has applied. Here's where we are in the process. Here's when we expect the landlord to get paid. And so that really helped to sort of slow down the process and also give landlords and tenants assurance that this um, money that had been allocated was actually going to make its way to the landlords so that they got paid and so that tenants could stay housed um, and landlords weren't as likely to push for you know evictions if they knew that the money was coming so that was also a really important part of the program. So these statistics here um, I won't go into too much detail, but you can see that there are about 300,000 applications that have been received to date. Um, in the online portal and about $850 million of spend, which includes the federal ERA funding. And then you can see other assistance, about $11 million um, from the state and a few other sources. And then a little bit more granular detail, you can see here where the money was actually going. So most of it was going to rent, some to electricity, water and heating, a little bit to sewer. Um, and then this program has helped about 145,000 people um, and the average assistance per person and per household hovers somewhere around um, 55 to 58. Um, so that's sort of where the money has been going um, in the program in Michigan. So the Michigan Supreme Court also got involved and I think really sort of helped to move the program along. Um, they, in, you know, encouraged people to use remote technology to the greatest extent possible. So this means that, you know, at the start of the pandemic and currently um, people are using Zoom court, which has been really helpful for tenants who, you know, previously maybe couldn't get to court and were missing their hearings and getting default judgments. Um, now they <clears throat> have the ability to be at work on their phone and take a few minutes um, to attend their court hearings. Um, also really important were pre-filing rental assistance available. So it used to be the case in Michigan that you had to get an eviction judgment on your record to actually apply for rental assistance. Um, and judgment on your record 
is, you know, very bad for a number of reasons. Um, it hurts credit scores. It's very difficult to, um, you know, maintain a rental history after you have an eviction on your record. So the fact that landlords and tenants could come together and actually apply for this SARA program before ever, before the landlord ever filed a case was quite new um, and something that was really helpful. Um, there's also a seven day adjournment after or the first pretrial hearing automatically. So this allowed tenants an opportunity to find counsel. That didn't mean that there was always counsel available, but it gave them an opportunity to go out and, and find counsel. And then last but not least, another really important piece that the Supreme Court put into place was a 30 day stay um, if a defendant has applied for SARA. So automatically that really slows things down and just gives the SARA process a chance to work and gives you know, the federal funding a chance to get to make its way to the landlords um, without anyone having to even ask for an adjournment or to sort of start a fight about that. So that's been some good news. <laughs> um, as I said, the eviction rate has been cut in half. Uh, legal representation, this is sort of astonishing, for tenants has increased from 5% um, to 95% in many places across the state. Um, in Detroit, there's now an ordinance that has established a right to counsel. Um, we'll sort of see how that plays out. I know Narinda has a bit more experience with that in New York because it's been around a little bit longer. Um, and then the Michigan Supreme Court has proposed a statewide order that sort of permanently adopts some of the changes I talked about. So permanently adopt adopting this eviction stay if a, if a tenant applies for rental assistance, continuing to offer those remote hearings, and attaching information about the rental assistance to the summons so that, you know, tenants are aware of the program because in the beginning, sort of getting the word out about the program was one of the biggest hurdles that we had in Michigan. So that's some good news. Um, some potentially uh, in bad news or, or something that we should be cautious about um, is the fact that the money in Michigan, unlike in New Mexico, is running out rapidly. So there was originally a $1.1 billion ERA allotment in Michigan, and there's about $250 million left. So what that means in terms of the timeline is that the program is ending um, at the end of this month, and no additional funds will be distributed after the end of September. So this has already meant that the pr procedures that I talked about, which were working fairly well, have had to change. So now you have to have an invitation to apply from the local housing authority to be able to get any money from the SARA program. Um, so there's no more pre-filing um, you know, agreements that can happen between landlords and tenants. And it's only if you have an active court case and are showing up for court, um, among other things that you can you can apply for the funding. And again, that's because the money is running out. So um, there's some room for caution. <laughs> um, I think currently the SARA program, program is spending about $50 million um, per month. And once the funding goes away, if there's no additional um, federal funding allotment, Michigan has indicated that there might be around $10 million. So there's going to be, you know, a drastic change in the amount of funding that's available. Um, and so what that means for the future, we'll see. Um, but hopefully in our role as advocates, we can continue to advocate for some, you know, funding, right to counsel and other things that I know we're going to talk a little bit more about. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Narinda. Great, thank you. So um, I wanna talk a bit about New Jersey. I am um, in transition from New Jersey to New York, but during the pandemic, I was living in and practicing in teaching in New Jersey. Um, I would say that uh, during the pandemic, New Jersey was quite similar to what has been described here by um, Professor Friedman and Professor Martinez in terms of the great number of evictions. I was um, at teaching at Rutgers University in Newark at the time, and so did a lot of work pre-pandemic on evictions in Newark alone. In Newark, 16,000 evictions were filed every year pre-pandemic. Um, and the largest housing provider was the Newark Pub um, Public Housing Authority, and the largest evictor was also the Newark Public Housing Authority, right? So, I mean, I want to start there to underscore the fact that unaffordability, even for people who are um, receiving public assistance, is really at the root of 
all of what we um, are talking about. Unaffordability by government standards means that you are paying more than 30% of your income for your housing needs. Um, and because of how our industries fluctuate or, or how, our, how um, poor people are paid in the industries that they are able to access for income, when they are approved for subsidy, their income can sometimes be much higher than it might be at other times during the year. So the fluctuation, if you think about Uber drivers or Uber Eats delivery people, or even home care folks or substitute teachers, um, all of these folks who are working, yes, there's a working families, but the type of work that they are doing means that their income fluctuates at a level that makes it hard to assess what 30% is at every, any given point in time. Like if we had a line graph, it would just move up and down, up and down, up and down, right? So affordability is the issue. And so I, I want to just raise that that's that's been the issue what we see, um, you know, saw in Newark and in New Jersey. Um, Newark is a, a New Jersey is a state of 450, a small state of 450,000 renters. So a lot, uh, you know, and those renters are largely in two cities, Camden and Newark. So Newark gives you a picture of what it's like to be a renter in New Jersey. Um, and so we understood very early on, uh, and I with some students were part of an initiative to call them the state, like the states issue moratoriums first. So right when March hit, when we knew people had to come home and they couldn't work, advocates, law professors, students, tenants got together and, you know, kind of tweet, did a Twitter storm that, that really urged this governor to put a moratorium on evictions. Because if you couldn't work, even this uneven work, you certainly couldn't pay your rent. And that moratorium was successful, right? And that's what stopped the evictions initially in New Jersey, and it stopped the evictions in many states. Before there was the national moratorium, there was the state moratorium on eviction. But again, just deeply tied to the fact that people weren't working, couldn't get money. And I just want everyone to follow that because the money is the key. In, in, my, in my estimation, all of this um, in New Jersey, you know, I don't even know if it's worth me saying all the things that they had, there's Zoom court, and I do want to talk about some of the challenges here, but I just want to say we have to follow the money. That money's always been the issue that the moratorium had to be put in place because people weren't working and couldn't make money. And that the only reason the tsunami that we expected didn't happen is because the federal government came in and gave money. So New Jersey is out of money. <laughs> we got $625 million in our first uh, disbursement. New Jersey received another over $44 million and then a third disbursement, again, around $42 million. Um, there in, in Newark applied for its own set of funds. It was out in December. Um, this money is gone. And there, there's reasons for that, some of which, I mean, it doesn't have to be gone. There was, there was this desire to spend right away, right, to spend it all. So fewer people were helped in New Jersey, at least through the system, because you could go backwards. And that's why I started with like how much people were insecure before pandemic because the money went backwards. It also could go forward for these this group of people. If you were able to access it, the money, um, the money could cover your pre-pandemic uh, um, old rent and it could cover up to a year. So 15 months total could be covered for any one family. Um, that meant... A lot of families were covered deeply, but many families weren't covered at all. Um, so we needed more money and we still need the money ongoing because that 30% people are living above that 30% even now, because we're kind of going back to pre-pandemic life, people are working, but they're not working enough or steadily to be able to pay 
even 30% of their income because sometimes that 30% fluctuates. So I want to talk about a couple more things. That's kind of like New Jersey. The, the fact of the matter is court never opened. If it's open, um, I should have checked. If I left practice there a couple of weeks ago, court never opened in person because of the sheer number of people who were crowded into a courtroom that was the size of my living room, right? So thousands of people every day, plus their children, their baby, their mom, their friend, their paramour, whoever with them, right, is, is just too many people in pandemic. It was always on Zoom. So, it, and I, I, when Allison said you could quickly handle your hearing, I applaud Detroit if the hearings were quick, because in New Jersey, they were not. Um, people were waiting for hours for Zoom court to proceed. And the judges were um, not exactly understanding to the fact that you can't always sit on Zoom in a car while you're supposed to be at work um, to wait for your name to be heard, or that you can't not take care of your children, even if you're on Zoom while you wait for your name to be heard. Um, I don't think employers were as forgiving, like when you have to show up at court, you have a notice that says you have to be somewhere so then you're not working. I don't think employers were up on the fact that like this was the same as court it meant you could not work. And so it created some tension for people. But I think these are all challenges that could be worked through. Um, technology, you know, the court did provide computers where people who just had no reliable technology could sign up and have their hearing at a computer docking station. So, and they could have a tech advisor. So someone who could help them manage Zoom for people who weren't Zoom savvy. Other challenges were that the public housing residents in New Jersey were at the back of the line. So if you were on public housing, you were not as readily able to access ERAP as others. That should be fine because the way that vouchers work, if you didn't have the money, the government should adjust, right? But the government was not adjusting. They were saying, get ERAP apply for ERAP and pay your landlord as opposed to the government adjusting your voucher paying more. So public housing residents, ironically, were kind of left in the cold in New Jersey's program. Um, and, and, you know, I think the timeline, right, um, landlords were getting antsy. And again, these are things that could be smoothed out. The wait for the money to get dispersed, um, Landlords did not want to wait, in, in, you know, um, and so um, trying to smooth that over without counsel was difficult. Um, and so folks who had counsel could navigate that, but if you didn't have counsel um, navigating that um, process with the landlord could be somewhat complicated. But me mediation was mandatory in New Jersey. And so sometimes judges have a more heavy hand um, during these processes than they might otherwise because they knew the money was available. And so they cautioned landlords to be patient. Um, I just want to talk now a little bit about what what the federal government did in the posture that it's taken. Overall, the federal government had ERA one, which was $25 billion in ERA two, which was at the tune of $21.55 billion. So two installments of ERA. It also urged, it had various summits um, starting out in June of 21, there was a breast practices summit which allowed all these states to hear what best practices might be because advocates already knew what's needed, right? Like Matthew Desmond's been doing this work, others, tenants, tenant advocates, people on the ground, legal aid societies have all been doing this work for decades. So people knew what was needed and the federal government was able to tap into that and share out to the states. They held it in July 21, they talked to county judges. In September 21, the federal government talked to mayors and governors. In August, they talked to Supreme Court justices and they issued through Merrick Garland, our attorney general, a call to action to law schools to get involved with providing the right to counsel in August. So June, July, August, and September, the federal government was trying to bring all of these national stakeholders together to make sure that everyone was on board with understanding that processes had to change. And that's good, right? 
in August, they also brought the Department of Labor, Treasury, HHS, and the CDC together to talk about all the different aspects of these programs that needed to come together to support the distribution of ERA and obviously the Treasury Department, very responsible for getting the money out to the states, right? I say this to say we have an infrastructure in place right now that is national, that involves all the stakeholders at the legislative letter level, statewide, locally, the Supreme Courts, the local courts, the schools, the law schools in many of these states. I think there are like 30 states that have law schools that participated, 99 law schools and like 30 states that participated in this program in the call to action. And so right now we are more, we are best positioned to keep this program going. In February, the Treasury Department was saying it was looking for more money because we can only expect the spike to come um, as soon as the states run out of money. And you'll see those spikes coming in at different times. Like I expect that New Jersey will go before Michigan, it, like given what we've just all spoken about and it will take New Mexico some, some months longer, but we'll all spike back up. And what Matthew Desmond calls for in his book at the conclusion of Evicted is a universal voucher program, which really ERA gave us the footprint for. It seems like impossible five, 10 years ago, and now we have everyone at the table that we need. And so I urge us. Um, I urge, you know, the landlord bar, which, I mean, you know, mortgages were paid because of this money. People didn't get foreclosed on. People didn't lose their homes because of this money. And the tenants bar, obviously, and tenant advocates to come together with all these other players in our states that are already at the table and try to urge the government forward in reissuing a third installment of the ERA. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been, sorry, I don't want to step on your toes. Amy, but, um, no, I, I think that's great. I, I Go ahead, Serge, and then we can, uh, I think you were going to talk a little bit more about right to counsel. Well, yeah, I mean, and some of the stuff that we've heard, right, I, I was really, like, um, really resonated with me what you, what Professor Hyatt said around how, you know, this stuff was, had been done there. Everybody knew what the problem, or not everybody, but people who had been working in this arena for years, Right. Understand these are the problems, and here's some some solutions that folks have proposed. That finally we're getting a little bit of traction, and um, I agree with Professor Hyatt. The money is crucial. Without the money, without a recognition that people, the base of all of this is people can't afford housing in this country, and there's many many ways to you know many many inputs to that. Right. We may we federal housing assistance. We might talk about. Um, living wages, about access to health care, child care, um, uh, you know, affordability of housing, creation of affordable housing. But at the root of it is really, this is just not affordable. Um, uh, so I, I think the, pro the conversation could start and stop with that. I just wanted to touch on some of the other work that I've seen from, from advocates through the years that have sort of bubbled up a little bit through this, through this process, right? Um, you, we've, we mentioned right to counsel um, was a thing in New York starting like four or five years ago. Um, and it is still, I think, very much a, an, ex an experimental phase there, but seems to have been really effective in keeping folks from being evicted when they have attorneys. Uh, and I am, even though I'm a law professor, not going to claim that the solution to every problem is to have more lawyers. And in fact, often that increases the problem. But I will say that that the there have been several places that have sort of experimented with this idea, and it's like I said, a surprising list I think of places that have that have got right to counsel. And this may not be exhaustive, but if you look at the years, um, right, may, many of these places are doing this post-pandemic um, and using funding that is, you know, that is ERAP funding, that is um, the American Recovery Fund, was it ARPA? I can't remember exactly what it stands for, my apologies, right? Um, it's using this funding as a, in an effort to experiment with and try to provide right to counsel, right? My own hometown of Louisville, Kentucky, uh, used this, allocated some money for right to counsel, saw it had an impact, and they ran out of the money, but now the city council is, you know, planning 
I think leaning towards advocating more of that uh, funding to, you know, city funding to this because they've seen the, that it can help people stop, help promote housing stability to have, you know, a right to counsel. This uh, housing Gideon idea that we, you know, people have talked about for years is happening in more places. And again, it is not a cure-all and, um, you know, money that is going to lawyers that could be going to tenants. You can certainly argue about that, but I do think it'll be interesting to see the, you know, what happens in the results of this sort of unintentional national uh, uh, sort of scattered site experiment. A few places are taking up the idea that a lot of folks have talked about of expungement of eviction records. Um, you know, in New Mexico, at least, it's relatively easy to get a criminal conviction of a criminal conviction expunged. It's impossible to get an eviction expunged. And um, in light of, you know, thinking when you think about the consequences of having an eviction on your record, what a lot of advocates call the scarlet E of eviction that you carry around with you and you makes it harder for you to get, you know, to get the next housing that you're living in and certainly pushes you down the rung of housing quality and um, and limits your ability to choose where you want to live and in some cases can, for example, um, disqualify you from public housing or other sorts of or or uh, vouchers or other sorts of assistance, right? That there are a few places, I think Illinois, Nevada, I don't have an exhaustive list, have said, we're going to expunge evictions that happened during the pandemic in recognition of the consequences that follow that, right? Now, I would say, okay, great. I love it. Now let's expand that to more things, uh, to, you know, to, to a larger time frame. But, you know, the optimist in me will say, oh, well, once these things are in place, you know, there's a, it, it's better to start and and hope that it will go on than than what we've had before, which was not not having that in place. As limited as it is, I'm hopeful that you know it will expand and folks will start to see the benefit to not tying a millstone around folks' neck that hampers their housing stability and causes challenges for families uh, far down the road um, when they get evicted. Uh, and you know, I've also heard this has not come up. Uh, no states are doing this that I'm aware of. But the, you know the moratoriums showed us that you can that when you don't evict people, the sky does not fall, right? That you can actually figure out ways to to promote that stability and and uh, the eviction courts may be a little bit emptier, but you know we're a lot. But there's many many benefits that come from that. But here in New Mexico, in lots of places, right? It's easy. You, you're under no obligation to renew someone's lease. You can just raise the rent. They, you know, they have to leave, or you can just decide not to keep them. It keeps people from advocating for their rights as tenants. If you know that if you complain about the fact that there's no heat, the landlord can just decide to terminate the lease next month. And so, I, there has been increased call for, and I support this. Um, a uh, good cause requirement for evictions. You evict somebody, you can, you know, uh, if someone is being an otherwise a, a, a good tenant, then you have to offer them to renew their lease. Uh, New York City has some of those, some programs like this, I think. Um, does New Jersey have that, Professor Hyde? Right? Yes. Um, and, you know, that is a way to promote tenants' rights and their ability to not be retaliated against when they complain, right? That might have to be coupled with limits, and I'm going to say rent control limits on, you know, how how much we can raise rents and decommodifying housing and treating it as a public good rather than a, an investment opportunity. But I think, you know, there's lots and lots and lots of ways to, to approach this. And some of what we're seeing post-pandemic is folks who have legislatures and, you know, places that have taken up the things that advocates have been calling for for years, and we'll see how those play out. But to me, that's promising. But as we've said, if it's you know if there's if there's no money, you know having a lawyer in court maybe isn't the most useful thing in the world. It's just someone standing next to you to kick the crank, kick the can down the road if you're still going to not have, be able to pay the rent next month. So without those resources, without affordability being addressed and whatnot, I I agree with Professor Hyatt's prescription. The the rest of this is just sort of you know. Yes. tinkering at the margins. 
You know, it's a, it was a really interesting time, isn't it, in landlord tenant law in the United States? I mean, we, we've gone through this crisis where everybody was very, very worried about the short term. And then there was a lot of people complaining and worried about the impact of the long term of, of the things that we did in the short term. But the other thing now is that we really have shifted the national discourse. And, uh, you know, to, ch- to quote the famous Churchill, never let a good crisis go to waste. I think that's kind of where we are right now. We're saying, what are the things in our landlord system, our landlord tenant system that have to change in order to have a better system going forward? And how has this pandemic experience crystallized our understanding of what those things are. And it seems like one of the things that like an artist that really does come down to money. Um, I've seen this in, in Kansas. We saw it in, in Michigan and in, in New Mexico, New Jersey. I'm sure every single state had to build from the ground up some mechanism to distributing these federal funds. We didn't have a federal funding system this way to any tenant. And now we've created it. Now it's there. Maybe, as, as Narendra said, maybe we do something with it. Um, but I wanted to bring in a question that directly ties to this, uh, which was from the uh, Q&A, that if we do provide additional assistance through people, what happens if you have, as currently is the case in most states, limitations on or no limitation on a landlord from just dis- uh, discriminating based on source of income, right? So then you maybe have landlords have even more of a reason to say, I do not want tenants who are using funded, you know, government funds to pay in my building. And I know we have state by state and some municipality who have um, made source of income discrimination illegal. Um, and I don't know if those are uh, well enforced, but I guess the question is, how does the source of income discrimination piece factor in to the question of providing that money that we need? Yeah, you know, I I would say that that's a great question. You know, people who have advocated for this approach, which is, right, um, a more national uh, program of subsidizing housing when in need, have um, argued that we need to expand the Federal Fair Housing Act to include sorry, there was a truck going by, to include source of income states. Um, you know, I've lived in, in D.C., New Jersey, and practice in, in now New York, um, and they all have source of income protection. But as you say, um, that that's not enough, right? Because the enforcement there is, um, you know, slight, given the number of attorneys who can actually do the work of, of, of enforcing it. What we need is what's happened here, right, is a shift. Anyone, whether they were a voucher holder or not, could apply for this funding, which normalized that if you need assistance, you should be able to get it from your government. There are other countries here. I think comparative law is helpful. There are other countries that we consider our peers in terms of development where um, subsidizing housing is normalized, is not um, a, is is not shamed, is not a basis of discrimination. And over time, I think we can get there with a, a, an access that is not limited to certain groups of people or in our na- national narrative limited to certain groups of people, because even now people of color receive um, you know, less subsidies than white people in our own our country right now, but that's not the narrative. I think what happened in pandemic was an understanding that anyone of any social economic background, of any race, of any gender can come upon hard times and need to have the government help subsidize their income so that their family doesn't end up on the street. And the pandemic, I think, equalized the conversation in that way. We can jumpstart the, the narrative going forward from hopefully that place, that more democratic place than we were pre-pandemic. The pushback on that is something that I'm also seeing in the Q&A, which is, shouldn't we permit landlords to discriminate on an economic basis? Anyway, that I think I'm just going to read this question. Is there any recognition that the poor often have other issues that make landlords legitimately not want them as tenants? And that's just the quote from the Q&A. And I think that ends up being the question, right? Is Is that, is it okay to allow people who are renting out their property, whether they say they have a class A property or something, really have a discrimination on the basis of 
the economic status of the tenant, even if they can get that rent from another source. Yeah. I mean, I, I think others should weigh in here, but I just want to encourage us to recognize that we are a country of poor people, right? The way, if you look at tiny houses, that's chic, but the time, if you look at van living, which is also chic, this is not chicness. This is America not being able to support its citizens in being providing housing, right? We need a new investment in housing as we've had in generations past. The reason that people have class A properties to rent is because the government subsidized home buying in America for generations past. It stopped doing that in both renting market and the home buying market. And now we have a nation of poor people who can't live anywhere. So we've gotten to a point where the poor is everyone. It's really, you know, it's really so many people that you know who are who are living check to check, who won like FMLA claim, uh, you know, going beyond the timeline um, are, 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 are subject to needing this help that I, I think we have to ch change who we think of as poor. Yeah, and I will say it, uh, one interesting thing that you can put side to side, and I do this in my housing class, is you look at the amount of federal money we spend subsidizing the, the cost of credit. mortgage lending, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's not just the home mortgage tax credit. There's right. a bunch of tax provisions and the support of the secondary mortgage market, Fannie Freddie. I mean, there's a whole huge amount that we spend to support people's uh, home affordability in terms of mortgage cost affordability. And and that's all done kind of hidden in a slight yeah. way. You don't have to walk around saying, I'm using my voucher to buy, pay my mortgage. But we, we have a more um, stigmatized and visible and much smaller su support system for people who are renters as opposed to mortgage borrowers. But I don't want to derail the conversation too much. Uh, any other thoughts about sort of the affordability um, money, uh, national voucher issues. That you uh, have. I mean, if I could just, just weigh in, like, I, look, I'm not going to say that there's no, no such thing as bad tenants out there, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily a function of are you know, rich people can be bad tenants too. Um, and in, and in lots of, lots of terrible ways, but this, this narrative that, I mean, what it comes down to is, ooh, I don't want to have poor people in my building, or my renters don't want to have poor people around, right? Well, the whole reason that we have this program, the Section 8 program, for example, is to, to decentralize poverty, to give folks access to living in, you know, in places of their choice, right? And I think to say, oh, you know, this person's poor, therefore they have these problems, therefore they shouldn't be, you know, I should be able to exclude them from my building, right? Aside from a whole host of other issues that I see with that. One is, it is, you know, actively countering this idea that we're using, that Section 8 and other voucher programs are intended to do exactly what this, you know, what that complaint is, which is to take people who are in concentrated poverty, and that brings with it many of the problems that folks are talking about, right, is associate correlated with and help them have more control, more freedom of, of where they live. Um, and so I'm I'm really not sympathetic to that um, because, you know, as because the larger goals, again, are to, to provide people with that opportunity. Uh, it's deconcentration of poverty, desegregate, desegregation racially, right? We know that there's there's a lot of systemic issues that that Section 8 is not going to cure them all, but is designed to address. And by saying, oh, yeah, but, you know, those people have problems. Well, yeah, and that's that's the systemic issue that we're also trying to, to, to address here. So I'm like, I'm perhaps uniquely unsympathetic, I guess, but, um, uh, or particularly unsympathetic, but I think it those conversations prioritize this sort of idea that well landlord tenant landlords you know housing is a business but it's not a business it's a public good no you can't opt out of the housing market right you have to live somewhere well we've opted people out but um to to have the conversation along those terms of you know what's best economically for landlords misses the picture that you know we have policies that are that um, are intended to try to make, help people have stable housing and this actively undermines that. Sorry, Professor Friedman, I think you're. Yeah, no, I was just gonna add that. I mean, I think at the core, right? Like housing is a, a fundamental right that 
trickles down to everything else in our lives, right? Healthcare, childcare, everything else. Um, and so I think that we can use our voices that, as advocates actually to, you know, picking up on what Professor Hyatt said, to continue the narrative of, you know, these ERA programs have allowed anyone to apply for funding. Um, it's not just a voucher program where, you know, only after being on a waiting list for 10 years, potentially can you get access to that. And so I think it's important that we use our voices as, as advocates to continue this conversation that has started um, rather than sort of, you know, falling back into, into a narrative um, that was a pre-pandemic. Right, and I do think that's really the question. And it comes from a point that, um, I can't remember which of you mentioned it, that the, the impetus behind the moratorium and then the ERA was twofold. On the one hand, it was that, gosh, we don't want people displaced in the middle of a pandemic. We're gonna have a health, public health impact and the CDC really hung their hat on that. Um, but I think everybody, even the CDC, realized that there was another very strong impetus, which is people have been harmed economically and they deserve assistance. And if the pandemic ever ends, the former kind of goes away, but the latter was always there and continues to be there. And I think that was Professor Hyatt's main point um, that she had made at the beginning of her presentation. Um, and again, there's a lot of other things now that have been opened up in the conversation. We've had some questions about, should the cutoff be 30%, should it be 40%? I actually think it's very interesting. 30% of someone who makes $30,000 is a completely different animal than 30% of someone who makes $300,000. I mean, we all pay the same amount for things like food. And so, you know, we go to the grocery store, the milk is gonna be the same for anyone, it's always too high. So um, that's, a, that's another interesting question. Some of these presumptions underlying our housing system are being questioned, and I think that's really good because I think that's going to leave us to some better uh, outcomes. Um, we're gonna run out of time, but I'm gonna kind of combine several other points to ask a question that's more on process. So we've had a lot of changes in the process here that you've mentioned. We have things like the Zoom appearances and should we have, uh, should we change the way we do landlord tenant court? Because most of the evictions came out of default judgments. People didn't even show up. Are we gonna be able to have better access to the system if we have a Zoom court or are there problems with the way we do that? Um, and I guess the question is, you know, do we have some sort of pre-judgment assistance situation where it stays for applicants? Do we have rights to counsel? And um, these sorts of process-based changes coming out of the pandemic experience. And we have a few more minutes, but I'd love to hear from each of you. If you had one um, one sort of pet thing that you really think would advance the system to a better place procedurally, what, what do you think that one thing would be? And we've talked about expungement, I think, too, also. Just to... Any thoughts? Or all of the above. <laughs> um, there's been we're all, some- We're all unmuted, yeah. so let's, you might have to call on one of us. Oh, uh, I, I would have- I'll go. I just want to say that we we really thought that Zoom court would open like if beforehand, before we knew the word Zoom, that technology would aim would aid court. But we found that court became closed and less public, more difficult for lawyers to observe, more difficult for the public to observe, more difficult for clients to attend. And so I think we're just trying to figure this out, right? Like something that we thought would be great has been uh, perhaps. Um, more challenging than we thought. I used to observe court all the time and have students observe court. And to your point about defaults, we were doing a project in New Jersey where we found that a substantial number of the defaults were without notice, right? And so we were challenging service and we would have never been able to get the kind of data that we had that challenged whether service had happened at all if court hadn't been open. So with court being closed and you only needing having can go if you have this link, um, it's, it's become difficult to watch the process. So I'll just raise that technology is helpful, but also that we have to watch that it doesn't create other additional challenges. And so we're all just in a point of flux. Thank you. So need to figure out what's going on with the online court of the future based on what we've learned from uh, the last couple of years. Allison, thoughts? Yeah, I guess I would say, um, I think one of the most important things that's happened are the um, stays, um, whether it's 30 days or an additional amount of time um, to allow the process of funding to play out. Um, you know, I think 
in a, you have to have the money there, um, as Professor Hyatt said, but then, you know, if you have the money slowing the process down and bringing, um, you know, landlords, attorneys, tenants, attorneys to the table so that everyone understands there's going to be this stay and then there's probably going to be additional adjournments as we sort of allow this to play out so that, you um, you know, the funding can actually uh, be used in the way that it's intended to. Um, so I think that's been one of the, the the biggest successes and something that I hope to see um, stick around to allow the money to actually do what it's meant to do. Thanks. And I mean, I, Professor Friedman stole my, my thought, but I just want to say, I've seen, you know, one of the primary things we advocate for when we try to address the landlord tenant law here is just more time. Right, time for a tenant to go access resources, to pick up a few more shifts at work and get another paycheck, to get to the, you know, there are resources, even pre-ERAP, we had some municipalities and some private sources, but they were just don't move quickly enough sometimes. And so what I've seen, you want hope a good takeaway, a takeaway would be like, you know what, we don't have to do this at a breakneck pace. We can say, look, there's an issue here. How can we all work together to try to make sure that you know the landlord gets paid and they can you know deal with the expenses that they have, and the tenant is able to pay that, but also remains stably housed. So um, you know it'd be great if we took that lesson from this. That like I said, the world doesn't fall apart when you have to wait more than three days to evict somebody. Um, but I'm also you know if I could just say there's been some really great stuff happening as we've talked about. What my what I'm concerned about is just us saying pandemic's done, now we can go back to normal and not learn our lesson, right? So it will require pressure from advocates to, to you know, keep, to keep talking about this, but also to comb through what we've seen and say, look, this actually worked, this actually was a thing, and, um, and to have hard evidence of the effectiveness of some of the things that we've advocated for. Yeah, and one, one actually uh, upsetting thing to me over the pandemic was the sort of demonization of landlords, when I think a lot of landlords were not doing anything wrong, they just needed their money. I mean, that's their source of income too. And it's certainly not fair to have costs allocated, if there are public costs allocated under private parties. So we're, we're really interesting uh, in an interesting place in the system. And honestly, we could go on another hour about it, but unfortunately we have run out of time and we don't have more time today. But I did want to thank all of you and our speakers and our uh, attendees for the great, interesting questions um, in the in the panel. Um, so appreciate it very, very much for taking the time to share. Um, I thank you for joining us. Remember, save the date for September 13th. And please note, if you've missed this or any other Professor Corners program in the past, we do ultimately have the recordings posted on the website. So you can go back and listen to them and see them again or miss if you missed the beginning part. We uh, encourage you to participate in one of our upcoming ECLE webinars, which you can register for by going onto the main section page. That's www.americanbar.org slash RPTE. And you can click on the events tab to view the entire listing of the different programs. On behalf of the ABA section of Real Property Trust and the state's law, thank you for coming. Thank you for participating in this program. We hope you found it informative and this concludes our webcast. Thank you very much. You may now disconnect.